again, I want to suggest that the premise uh, uh, that is embedded in this panel is that uh, the structure of legal education is facing some challenges. It's broken, which is not to say it's irretrievably broken. And, uh, and, uh, and we're all hard at work, and I, I mean the we, the collective, as much or more the audience as those of us on the panel, at, uh, at developing some constructive uh, changes. Who says so? Well, for one thing, external stakeholders of different shapes and sizes uh, say so. Without endorsing any particular body or bevy of criticisms, you'll just note the, the rash of, uh, of critiques from the bench and the bar, the ABA Task Force on Legal Education, uh, it, and its report suggested various ways in which uh, innovation was not only warranted but imperative. Not only the ABA task force, but the next ABA task force, which is focusing as we speak on financing of legal education. And that is not even to mention the various, I don't know if there are 50 of them, but the plethora of uh, state bar uh, uh, organizations, uh, task forces, some whose reports have been completed, some who are underway who not only embrace the premise, but are really arguing for, in fairly interesting ways, the proposition that legal education uh, must, uh, must uh, change. Universities, again, not to be overly cynical about it, but in, the, but in the era in which law schools were, if not cash cows, then were net contributors, and on a fairly broad scale, it was, uh, uh, by and large, uh, perfectly fine for university leadership to regard law schools as essentially doing, uh, doing important business on behalf of universities. And I, and I don't mean, mean to be crass about it, not simply that, that provosts and presidents and trustees were looking at it solely in economic terms, but after all, law schools, insofar as their economic well-being was pretty sound, they, that is university leadership, could focus their precious time and attention on, uh, on parts of the, of the university that were less uh, 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 stable. And that has started to change. So if we want to avoid going the way of the dental schools of a past era, then it's really imperative from a university perspective, from university leadership perspective, that law schools uh, undertake changes. And of course, last but not least, external stakeholders are prospective students, for goodness sake. And that is who are voting with their feet and voting with their voice in, in many respects in calling for, uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, implementation, uh, for innovation. So external stakeholders are bringing to bear this kind of pressure and influence on law schools to undertake innovations. There's also the business of, again, not to be too clever about it, surviving and thriving. Some law schools are needing to innovate and want to innovate in order to, uh, in order to survive. For most law schools, it's not so much about survival. It's about thriving in a very competitive business, that is, uh, uh, inner law school competition. And also, uh, again, in order to thrive for the well-being of, of, uh, of, of the students. And last but not least, and we'll hear, we'll hear uh, certainly uh, uh, much about this in the, in, the, in, the, in the time of this panel, structural changes in the profession. Alternative models of the delivery of legal services that are uh, out and about and around us, wherever uh, our graduates are practicing. The so-called access gap, right, the puzzle of so many uh, uh, unmet legal needs of the middle class and the lower class and so many lawyers. And what, what I call, and others do as well, the increasing relevance of the law business technology uh, inter interface. Uh, I, I sometimes say in, in various uh, venues in, uh, among law firm partners and others that 20 years ago, uh, from now, 30 years from now, choose your, choose your crystal ball. We may look back at professional education, the siloing of law schools and business schools and engineering schools and computer science departments and saying, what was that about? When in the real world, folks in business, folks in law, folks in engineering are actually working constructively together. And so, so that, that is trying, in a, in, a, in a relatively short period, to set the, uh, to set the table. Without further ado, let me, let me introduce this group of really remarkable uh, uh, cronies. I'm sorry, uh, leaders in innovation. And they share in common, uh, not only uh, they, they are distinguished and important lawyers, uh, but also that they are, in fact, undertaking significant innovations where they, uh, where they are and where they reside. So in no particular uh, order, because this is not going to be a series of talks that's going to be, it's going to function as a roundtable where I'm going to ask some questions and, and leave ample time for your own participation. Uh, Mike Madison, who is a law professor uh, at the University of uh, Pittsburgh. He was the research dean for a number of years at Pitt. Uh, he's the co-editor of Commercial Announcement Coming, Governing Knowledge Commons just published by Oxford Press, and he's the faculty director of something I'm, I'm sure he'll tell us a little bit about, Pitt's Innovation Practice Institute. Uh, Marty Katz is the dean of the Sturm College of Law at the University of Denver. 
It's a distinguished uh, law faculty member there who, among his many responsibilities and talents at Denver, has been, as you, as you, I'm sure you know, been a leader in experiential education. He's written uh, copiously on that subject. He has walked the walk in leading a, uh, a remarkable strategic planning enterprise at Denver, which I refer you to their website for some very interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, things going on at Denver. And he's the founding board member, a founding board member of an organization called Educating Tomorrow's Lawyers. He came to Denver following a career as a lawyer, and indeed was a partner at Davis, Graham, and Stubb. Uh, 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 Kelly Testi, who is the Dean and Judge James Mifflin University Professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, another law school which is, which is undertaking some really remarkable uh, innovations. Uh, in the next 24 hours, I think, Kelly will be, uh, uh, will be elected President-elect of the Association of American Law Schools. I'm delighted to have, to have Kelly uh, aboard. I'm going to uh, do something that I hope I wouldn't have to do, but I'm going to do it because I want to get it right, and that is when it comes to Paul Lippi, who's on this panel, uh, I want to make sure that I have his, uh, his uh, intro reasonably uh, accurate, because he does a lot of weird things. I mean, very interesting things. So uh, Paul, after graduating from law school in 1984, became one of the first new model general counsels in Silicon Valley. In that role, in addition to managing the legal function, he also ran business development, where he benchmarked many other functions across different companies and corporate marketing, and where he led his company's collaborations with engineering and business schools. In 2000, Paul was hired by Stanford Medical School to be CEO of its first e-learning spinoff, winning AMA accreditation for in-context learning. Paul more recently started OnRamp, together with Cisco Systems and several law firms, and over the course of the last two years, has established Apprentice Ramped as a leading bridge to practice program, connecting recent grads and 3Ls at more than 15 law schools with the most sophisticated project requirements for global enterprises. So, very interesting group. Let's, uh, let's, let's get uh, started. I will, uh, uh, having, having uh, taken my own stab at setting the table by talking about the premise of innovation, let me actually ask this panel to, to chime in and just start out by asking why is innovation uh, needed? What is the imperative to which innovation in law schools does or ought to uh, respond? So, Marty, you want to go? Go first. So, yep. Here you go. So, in, in any enterprise, is this working? Yeah, okay. In any enterprise or endeavor, we need innovation for continuous improvement. That, that's sort of the baseline. In any business, innovation is necessary to adapt to a, to a changing environment. I'd say the reason why we're having this discussion here is that actually in law and law school, both law practice and law school, um, we've seen ourselves as very insulated from any kind of need from insulation, uh, for, for innov from innovation. And so in many cases, it's, it's sort of hard to see, hard for us to see the imperative of innovation. But it's there. Uh, there's need in the gap between what clients want and what they get. There's need in the gap between the value that, that law students are looking for and what they get. And that's why we're seeing that the types of things that Dan's talking about in terms of the external stakeholders uh, responding the way they are. Um, so if we don't respond to provide that value, uh, the really simple way to put it is we are going to continue to lose students. Um, both because clients aren't going to want to hire those students when they graduate and because those students aren't going to want to come to our law school. So that, that's the imperative. So I just want to emphasize that in my view, even though I, I teach and write about innovation and innovation law, I'm an IP guy, innovation is a means to an end. I want, to, I want to highlight what Marty just talked about in terms of gaps, and I want to focus on the idea of gaps, not at just at the level of legal education in general, and not just at the level of uh, law schools as collectives, but talk about gaps in terms of individual effort and enterprise by individual faculty members, because that's really how I think about what I'm doing. Uh, I think about a vision of the kind of impact that I want to have on my students, on our graduates, the kind of impact that I, I imagine that they will have on our communities and on their clients, and the gap between what I'm actually able to realize and achieve in the classroom or in my teaching with them and what they're actually executing out there in the world. There's a gap between my vision for them and their visions for themselves. That is, I'm speaking of our students and then ultimately of their clients and what I'm actually able to achieve. And so closing that gap 
addressing that gap is really where innovation, whether you like that word or that phrase or that idea, it's how to approach that gap. That was, that's what we're really talking about here. Innovation is a great way to focus and concentrate energy in that area, but innovation by itself is not the goal. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, just a couple opening remarks. Uh, the first is that I think that all of us that are living in the 21st century and in the second decade, no matter what our product is, the, the world is asking us to do it faster, better, and cheaper. That's just what every industry is experiencing. And so we're not, as legal educators, insulated from that. And so in some ways, the innovation imperative comes from that. But one of the things that's hard is that our product is not a widget. You know, it's not how to make even a computer chip faster, better, cheaper. Uh, you know, our product is, as one of my uh, former presidents used to say, roughing people up intellectually. Um, and that is a little harder to do faster, better, cheaper, isn't it? Uh, so I think some of the innovation imperative comes from uh, an experience that no matter what we're working in in the world, that's what we're being asked to do as technology and globalization pushes us in that direction. The second point I would make in the opening is just that in some ways I, I know that this time is different for our legal education as we're experiencing a lot of pressure. But as the more you look back on the trends we've been through, it's also not that much different than other times we've been in. And I believe that innovation is quite a catchword right now, but it's really nothing more than we've always needed to do, which is to continue to try to do better for our students and our world. I'm still quelling at the notion of being Dan's crony here, so I'm not sure <laughs> what more I can say. Um, Maybe just two reference points. So as it happens, Marty and I were both in the same law firm in Denver. Didn't overlap much. But so when I graduated from law school in 1984, the tuition, I think, was $7,000. And the starting salary in a mid-sized Denver law firm, which was not a premium payer, was $36,000. So 5x um, uh, tuition was the starting salary, which I think at the time was viewed as reasonably manageable. I think everybody knows that number today is probably around one and a half to two X for, for most of your graduates who can find jobs. And then second, I was reading the Wall Street Journal this morning, which I don't do too much in the post-Murdoch uh, um, days, but uh, there was a good story about the, the Detroit bankruptcy. So the Detroit municipal bankruptcy, which is the largest municipal bankruptcy ever, the headline, unsurprisingly, from the Wall Street Journal is, Record fees in Detroit bankruptcy, Lawyer, uh, legions of lawyers, consultants, and other advisors have been paid nearly $178 million for their work on Detroit's historic bankruptcy. So I don't think any of us knows whether $178 million is the right number or $78 million or $578 million. Um, but I think we would generally agree that as between money going to professional fees or money going to pay people's pensions or to improve education or municipal infrastructure in Detroit, probably just as well if some of that money went to uh, something other than professional fees. So I do think we face a challenge, uh, as, as all the other panelists have said, to basically for law to keep pace with other fields in terms of improving the value and re reducing the cost of what it does. And we recognize, I think, you know, two things. One is it's a, law school is a relatively constrained environment. Everybody would acknowledge that, but that, that's not the same as being entirely constrained. And secondarily, law as a market is a relatively, um, yeah, what's the right word, relatively non-transparent market, which is what you'd expect both for something that's professional services and something where the market participants govern market entry. So that, that's not a shocker. And again, it, none of this is anything new. The question is, how do we fulfill our uh, responsibility uh, in, this, uh, in, the, in the face of these challenges? Thank you. Let me. Uh I want to turn next to to uh, to war stories uh, of sorts, at least. Although I'm sure that uh, you can draw on your own experience or or uh, or look at uh, look at hearsay, and that is, I want to uh, ask the panelists to to give an example, reflect on an example of of one or two innovations that have worked. Again, whether whether from your own vantage point in your own law schools or elsewhere, uh, and uh, and then discuss you know, what were the obstacles and why it did work. Then, of course, you can guess the next question, some examples uh, of innovations that didn't work, uh, and what were the obstacles and why it didn't. So if you want to choose the, the did or didn't first is, that, is entirely up to you. 
No, uh, let me uh, ask Kelly. Maybe you could start. Sure, be glad to. Um, let me give an example first of an innovation at the University of Washington that I think is uh, hasn't really worked. Still, work in progress, and we're evaluating how to how to. Uh, treat it. We're a very globally focused law school. You know, our mission is is leaders for the global common good, and uh, and so as part of that, we were thinking, well, how do you actually make that real? And so we added to our first year curriculum a required 1L class in international and comparative law, which seemed like a, a great idea in terms of getting our students off in that uh, you know good groundwork for understanding that the the law is a global uh, institution. And what's been interesting to us is that so far the student discontent with that is, is quite stunning. Um, <laughs> and we, we examine, you know, why and we've, uh, we've certainly uh, made sure we have great teachers in it and uh, you know, some of our very best. Um, but it continues to be something that we see the students not at all being satisfied with. And in fact, it's had exactly the opposite effect that we had hoped. We thought it would spur interest in our upper level international comparative law offerings. And those enrollments have really declined dramatically since we instituted this, this course. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that the reason I mentioned this is one other question that Dan had posed is, you know, are students your partners in innovation or not? And I think this could suggest that there is a conservatism among students because so much of what they do indicate to us is, wait a minute, other schools don't teach this in the first year. Wait a minute, my buddy at Harvard, you know, my buddy wherever doesn't have this. Um, there aren't Gilberts for it or whatever else there might be. So I want to mention that as something that I think, you know, has been, uh, been difficult. Now, Dan, do you want us to go on and tell about a success or? or? However you wish. Okay, yeah. let me mention something that I think has. Because that was sort of a buzzkill, so I kind of, you know, I know, to bring I know. It back to well, <laughs> I thought I'd get it out of the way first. Um, one of the innovations in our, in our school that I think is, is, been terrific and is really thriving is, is what's called a tech policy lab. And it's a partnership between the law school, the information school, and the computer science and engineering department. So it's very interdisciplinary and what it aims to do is to put technology um, development and policy and law considerations together and so that those happen at the same time. And so issues like robotics, you know, it, all issues of tech policy are now something that is, are incubated in this lab. There's both teaching and research parts of that. And I want to say that I think it worked because the faculty members involved are very good. The university was really supportive of the STEM fields and so law and policy being more involved in those was something that was accepted at the university level. We had partnerships with the corporate sector in this in terms of startup funding and that of course helps so much because that's often the hardest thing to get is the seed funding for, for new initiatives. So those are some of the conditions that I think help that innovation thrive. Marty? So I'm going to go with uh, primacy as opposed to recency and go with the success first. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the thing that I think worked for us very well at, at University of Denver uh, in terms of innovating was this project we call the Experiential Advantage Program. So five years ago, uh, as part of our strategic, strategic planning process, uh, we committed that we were going to, to get to the point where any student who wanted uh, could take a full year worth of experiential classes, uh, including uh, having either a clinic or an externship. And that was a pretty audacious goal at the time because if you looked at our capacity to deliver that uh, compared to what we needed to make this a reality, uh, there was a pretty significant gap. Uh, and we were actually, it was a five-year goal. Uh, we were able to roll it out uh, nearly two years ahead of schedule. And so that was a pretty big success story for us. The, uh, so the obstacles were capacity and also culture. Uh, the, the way that, that we thought about our, our law faculty is there were certain people who did this type of teaching and then there were certain people who didn't. And if you saw that as, as kind of a hard and fast line, uh, we were never going to build the capacity that we needed. It worked largely, I, I would say, uh, in, in, in large part because the faculty developed this as a shared goal in response to a real need that they saw out there in the community. So when we did our strategic planning process, we actually had the faculty go out and talk to people in the community, to clients, to people who are, were to law firms, to other legal services organizations, 
asking what are you going to need to want to hire our students? Along with the understanding by faculty that unless that was happening, unless our students were getting hired by these folks, uh, we were, our, our jobs were literally in jeopardy. So that kind of connection to the goal, I'd say, uh, was key toward uh, getting it done. Also the partnership with the community, as, as, as Kelly was talking about, uh, becomes as essential to getting this type of thing go, uh, going. There are also, uh, an, another thing, just to be a little bit crass about it, uh, that gets things like this going are incentives. Uh, for law faculty, right, I, I talk about uh, time, money, and love, right? So time off uh, uh, teaching money in the form of stipends and love in the form of respect, uh, making clear that this is, is something that's valuable to us as, as a community. Uh, an example of an innovation. Can love substitute for money, uh, Marty? In Unfortunately not, oh. it's been my experience. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. Which uh, of those do we get as a crony? <laughs> Need a new crony. Um, an example of something that, that didn't work so well uh, in terms of innovation, and I'm, I'm interested in, in what Kelly's talking about, this interdisciplinary uh, innovation that, that's been going on at Washington. We've had a few successes in, in the interdisciplinary arena, uh, but we've, th there's a lot of headwind there. And I would say that the, the reason why is that as a university, although we talk a pretty good game about uh, wanting to do interdisciplinary work and the need for it, there are frankly some structures in place that make it hard to do that. Uh, talk about disincentives. Any time that we as a law school uh, engage in some sort of a joint uh, project with someone, uh, we lose money and we don't get love in return. Um, so. Uh, there, there are, are impediments. Now, you do it because it's the right thing to do, and, and we certainly have, and some of my dean colleagues at, at University of Denver have done this type of projects, uh, but we're really hopeful that our, our new chancellor, who's very dedicated to interdisciplinary work, uh, is going to take a look at, at some of the incentives and disincentives uh, for creating interdisciplinary projects, because that is very important. That's, uh, that's what uh, clients are, are telling us over and over again is, is going to be extremely important in the next generation of uh, lawyers. Paul, you, you can, of course, give any example you want, but I, I hope you'll also use this platform to maybe describe a little bit about legal on-ramp, just as a... Sure. Uh, well, let me, let me start with um, a failure. So the, the thing that we did at Stanford was a failure. Um, and uh, it's probably still, um, I, I ran into Alan Garber the other day, who's now the provost at Harvard. He said, you know, that's still sort of the reference set for distance learning and university venture. So uh, let me talk about that for a second. So we, so broadly speaking, it's kind of obvious in today's world that, that what looked historically like three distinct markets, sort of professional publishing, professional continuing education, and what you might broadly call sort of the elucidation of best practice or kind of evidence-based practice, those are all converging um, and either will or won't be situated in, in realistically elite universities um, that can deliver a product on a global basis. So, so Stanford Medical School thought, well, we can create a, you know, kind of a digital learning and practice product for docs and um, you know through the vagaries of whatever I got hired to be the CEO of that uh, and so it, it didn't work and I would say broadly it didn't work for two reasons one because it was an innovation and, and by and large most innovations don't work so you know will 10 percent of innovations work will 30 percent of innovations work I have no idea but but it, it's tautological that if it's an it's an innovation more likely than not it won't work so there, there has to be some tolerance for for that and then, you know, broadly speaking, that's not a big headline, a university governance model is, is not very innovation friendly, it tends to be a very conservative, many stakeholders, you know, yada yada, sort of obvious stuff, uh, which is why, you know, the model of people leaving the institution, founding new ventures, which have a narrower, more fo focused governance model, and then, you know, hopefully giving their, their lottery winnings back to the institution is a, is a winning model the sort of university incubated hosted things is trickier that said I think you know people should look for ways to try to engage broadly with uh, their extended communities and create knowledge products and learning products that are valuable uh, in terms of on-ramp um, uh, you know I could talk for a while but just briefly we, we, we kicked this off about 18 months ago when I spoke to the uh, Barry Courier's meeting in Arizona about, you know, innovation challenges. 
we happen to have a guy from a, a London-based bank who was video conferencing in from his seaside retreat, or actually was, he lives out, out in the countryside. Um, and we said, look, we, you know, we have these massive projects that need to be undertaken. We can, because we, we, we're pretty rigorous about structure and methodology, we can create um, a working context where people, which is, you know, non-hierarchical, where people have objective ways of measuring performance and and uh, we can train them up and there's high value and, and we, you know, frankly, have, uh, in some ways we're, we're still a work in progress, but in at least two respects we've kind of exceeded our expectation. One, Barney Frank, you know, the guy that wrote the bill, he's now telling Harvard and everybody else this is great, this is what we had in mind in terms of facilitating compliance, so that's good. And second, I don't know if, if Frank Wu is here from Hastings, but we, we hired somebody straight out of Hastings a year ago and she's, you know, and she's now running a project with Cisco to the extent that, you know, basically over the last two weeks I didn't spend any time working on it because she was running a, a project which is probably one of the more advanced um, undertakings in law today. So I think, you know, the bad news is it's a broadly constrained environment. We all understand that. Um, and we're behind, and we can all define the root cause of that to the extent to which we're defined, behind. But it's, I think, self-evident we're somewhat behind. The good news is, okay, we're behind, everybody's constrained, so doing things that have a reasonable probability of working is not that hard to do. Pick those that, you know, align with the mission and the values of your, your institutions and you'll have a pretty good chance of success. I think you'll find the young people are, you know, they got the memo. They're not um, delusional at this point. It's not, it's not four years ago, it's not six years ago. Uh, and uh, Wiser's tweeting back there when I'm getting the notifications here. How am I doing, Phil? Am I doing okay? Uh, 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 so, so they're ready to lead. Your faculty, you know, some of them are ready to lead, some of them are not. It is what it is. But your students and your recent grads, I think, are ready to lead. I'm going to jump in and ask the next question, but call on Mike first. Uh, if you okay, so. Uh, let me talk, because Dan highlighted it in the intro, uh, both success and not exactly failure, but not clear success yet in the context of this Innovation Practice Institute, or IPI, at Pitt. Um, what the IPI, it's a center. We call it an institute for university governance reasons, but it's, it's, we call it IPI. It is an umbrella entity that I lead as faculty director. I have a colleague who's an executive director who does a lot of the operational stuff. Uh, that is an umbrella for community partnerships around the Pittsburgh region, some on campus at the University of Pittsburgh, some in the Oakland neighborhood, which is also the home of Carnegie Mellon University, so some things up at CMU, some of the technology accelerators and incubators that are emerging in Pittsburgh, some of the non-tech uh, organizations around Pittsburgh, because we are definitely interested in innovation beyond just the tech space, the not-for-profit community, social enterprise, uh, government service, and so forth. What we're doing is through those relationships is creating space for our students to have non-curricular experiential opportunities to partner with their peers, grad students in other disciplines, computer science, engineering, business, uh, and so forth, uh, in a supervised way using uh, friends of the law school, often alumni who are practicing in Pittsburgh, guiding them in teams to develop ventures or, or bring ventures to fruition. So for example, we do quarterly program, excuse me, monthly programs up at Carnegie Mellon with an innovation oriented portion of the computer science department at CMU. We have about a hundred people in the room per session, two-thirds engineers and grads and computer science students, one-third law students, a presentation by a downtown uh, practicing lawyer on some aspect of the law relevant to creating and organizing new ventures. Uh, and then at the close of these presentations, we make sure that the students are organized into working teams and they have some light supervision and go off and, and do their thing, reconvene a month later with some new legal topic. Uh, we're placing students in what we call office hours uh, in supervised ways in some of the accelerators and incubators around Pittsburgh. Note a couple of things that I've talked about. Uh, I've not talked about curriculum. I have not talked about faculty colleagues. I have not talked about uh, the dean uh, sort of actively managing or supervising any of this stuff. This is very much a pot of money that we have been given initially by one of the foundations in Pittsburgh, more recently internally by the university. We also have some law firm friends in town. Uh, but we have been given a, a great amount of, of rope uh, to run with in building this so somewhat autonomously relative to the rest of the, the rest of the law school community. The success 
has been that just for example, over the last two semesters, we had 175 different students participate in one of our programs. Uh, that's roughly one third of the law school community. So this, as Paul said, the demand for this stuff, the interest in this stuff among the student body is enormous. The receptivity to this among our community partners is tremendous. The, the lack of success is metrics for evaluating whether this in fact is going to have the kind of impact that we want it to have in terms of community payoff, in terms of client benefit once the students graduate is very unclear. Right, so the, the original vision for this was to create a cadre of new lawyers in the region that could help regrow and renew the Pittsburgh region. That's still the vision, but it will take a long time to figure out whether that's actually going to pay off. So I want to build just on that, uh, that those insights from Mike. Uh, a number of you have mentioned the communities of which you're a part. Marty was talking about Denver, and, and, uh, and so I want to ask this question. How can the legal community thinking particularly of law firms, but not exclusively law firms, the business community and the civic communities uh, be helpful in partnering, helpful partners in innovation? Maybe by way of examples or, Marty? So I, I would say in, in both the, the conceptualization and, and the implementation, it's, it's gonna be pretty key to, to, uh, to work with the legal and, and the business community, uh, at least if, if for, for most forms of innovation that are gonna happen at a law school. At the implementation stage, uh, it, it's important to partner with, with them in terms of deciding, figuring out what the need is. It's also, an, and I, I'm, I, other people have, have mentioned the importance of, of bringing in uh, in, in faculty, I mean, what Michael's talking about in, in terms of uh, the difference between sort of one faculty member doing something and, and possibly doing something that, that's a little more school-wide. Um, so at the implementation, at, at, at the origination stage, the, the discussion that, that I think you need to have between your faculty uh, and the community is, is important to get everyone on board. In terms of actually implementing uh, innovation, if, if we think about it, uh, we're pretty resource constrained these days at, at law school. So anything that we can do to bring in help uh, to, to the types of education that we're providing uh, is important, both because it's relevant, because our, our students are going to, uh, to be able to get a lot out of it and, and start to tie what they're learning to what they're actually going to be doing. Uh, but also bringing in expertise that, uh, that, that frankly we may not have within the walls of, of the law school. I like to, uh, I realize it, it sounds a little ambitious, but, it, but sometimes we, we talk about sort of a unified field theory as, as you might think about in, in, in law, um, and the, or at least in legal education. And the concept is starting with what the people who are gonna hire our students are going to be looking for and working that back through whatever innovations we develop at our law schools. There's a, a project going on right now uh, that's actually funded by the Hewlett Foundation to educating tomorrow's lawyers uh, called Foundations for Practice. And, and this is an, a, an attempt uh, to sort of generate that this notion that what we are providing our students is very much focused uh, by what people who are out there in practice with their clients are telling us they need from the next generation of lawyers. Yeah. Kelly? Dan, I think uh, that's a really important question. There's a lot of ways in which uh, external partners can be just so important. And I think of it as, you know, almost a constant feedback loop in the sense that trying to listen uh, to what the community is needing from the school in terms of the education of the graduates. And let me give a couple examples there. You know, I always go out and ask the question, you know, how are graduates doing? What skills do you need that they're, they maybe don't have, et cetera? And so you learn a lot there. And one of the things we were hearing was that, the, um, that there were skills that, you know, we talk a lot about practice ready, but in many ways that phrase still captures a fairly narrow uh, swath of skills that are more litigation oriented. And so we were hearing more that what students needed were more business and financial literacy, scientific literacy, project management, leadership development, things like that. And that's given us a realization of how we need to think more broadly about our curriculum and the kinds of things that um, should be in that, and hopefully a little better received than the international and comparative law um, idea. 
Um, the other thing that I want to say, too, is just that the external community is so important in affluence and influence in the sense that, of course, we need to look to that community for help in financing some of these new initiatives. Um, you know, you really don't want to be in a position of looking to tuition dollars for new things, you know, one of the, because you need to leave room for some of those to fail. Uh, they're bound to, you know, as you, as you noted, Paul. Um, and so looking to the community to help fund new initiatives, I think, is critical. And in many ways, not only can the community help with that funding themselves, but they have a network of people that they can put you in connection with that can help with, um, you know, getting the right people at the table to, to help found and then implement some of these new ideas. Mike, you already talked about this a bit, uh, just so to just maybe elaborate a little bit, because you mentioned Pittsburgh and the contributions to the Pittsburgh community, but what I didn't hear you say is sort of how the Pittsburgh civic community or business community sort of as a feedback loop is helping that process along, or are they? Well, so I, I wanted to sort of distinguish the sort of the community sort of framing uh, from what we've experienced. So I'm a big fan of that part of the management literature that focuses on positive deviance. So what that means, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, is that in any population, in any firm, in any organization, in any marketplace, there are those individual people who have a sense of personal agency and ambition and opportunity that really distinguishes themselves from the surrounding community. Those are the people who are your change agents. Those are the people who are apt to wake up in the morning and want to go out and do new or different or great or ambitious things just because that's in their character. Uh, so what we have found in, in Pittsburgh, in my experience, is that those people exist. They exist in my law school. They exist on my university campus. They exist on our partner campus at Carnegie Mellon. They exist in the business community. They exist in the law firm and, and other legal communities around town. So one of my big challenges at, as faculty director of the IPI is finding these people. They are often alumni, but they are not always alumni. They are often lawyers, but they are not always alum uh, lawyers. They are sometimes in local government, but they are not necessarily in local government. Finding them, they often are not hard to find, actually, because they tend to raise their hands. Uh, uh, contacting them, working with them, having lunch with them, figuring out what they're passionate about, what they really want to do, and then building a program, whether it's resource development, time, love, uh, other kinds of contributions that relies on that set of, of passions and contributions because it, it doesn't completely offset the basic need to have money to make things run, but you can get a lot done with just the basic passions of people. So when I talked about our partner uh, contributions from a downtown law firm that help our relationship with Carnegie Mellon run, there's two senior partners at one of Pittsburgh's largest downtown law firms, alumni of our school, who volunteer their time to come out and supervise those programs. Now, I know that it's not pure selflessness on their part, but frankly, I don't care because they're coming out and they're doing a great service for our, our school and for our students and, and for the community. Uh, so really what we've been doing is building a portfolio of those kinds of change agents or positive deviants, working with them, and then over time institutionalizing the programs that we're able to build with their contributions. Great, thanks. I want to ask Paul to answer the same question, but I want to sharpen it just a, just, just a bit before I do, because this has been I'm something. Crony What's that? All right, so you, you can uncrony yourself. Switch, huh? <laughs> really struck a nerve there with you, didn't it, Paul? Uh, so, so you recall the question is how can the legal, business, and civic communities help uh, innovation? But I really want you to maybe to focus on, on lawyers and law firms, how they're helping or obstacles to innovation. Particularly, I mean, from your from your vantage point. All right. Well, that's a terrific question, Dan. Let me ask, answer the question that I feel like answering, if I may. Um, <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> uh, well, look. I mean, lawyer, law firms are. Uh, there's been a slightly, you know, symbiotic, non-innovative dynamic between law schools and law firms, which, again, if you think about the structure of the market, it's not surprising. So. What's happened in, in our, you know, our professional lifetime is that the, the, the center of the gravity of the legal profession has moved from law firms to large legal departments, I would say, candidly led initially by, by Silicon Valley. Um, that's not completely true, but it's, it's, a, it's a marked thing. So, and the law firms are responding to client demand. They're not 
by and large, leading in innovation, although there's, there's innovation uh, throughout the world of law firms, but it's, it's not, um, you know, it's not wholly in their DNA. And I do think, unlike, you know, it's useful to have a metaphor, so I'm not going to say that medical schools or engineering schools are perfect, but both medical schools and engineering schools leave their graduates, send their graduates into the world with the notion that there will be ongoing improvements to methodologies, that those improvements will be measured, that they'll be facilitated by tools, and that the professional school will play a role in that. By and large, the law schools have not stepped into that role other than perhaps to the extent that they view themselves as supporting the role of, of judges or, in some cases, government officials. So, so that opportunity, that gap is there. So if the answer is, well, I'll, I'll learn what to do by going to asking my local law firm, you know, I think that's, that's fine, and obviously those are important stakeholders for any law school, but they're, they're, they're probably equally as uncertain about what to do next um, as the law school. I, I'll, you know, share a little anecdote. I was in, uh, in Portland about three weeks ago. I don't know if anybody here is from Oregon, but the federal judge there, Ann Aiken, who I n never met before until one of these other DLEs, you know, she is very passionate about access to justice and the status of, of res recidivism programs and also of, uh, of some of the law school-based clinics in her state. So she convened a meeting uh, in the federal courthouse, the uh, Mark Hadfield courthouse, and had a couple of outsiders, Dan Katz from Michigan State and me, I forget, a couple other people, and then mostly, you know, folks from Oregon basically saying, how do we as a state look at the provision of legal services, access to justice, the role of the law school, the role of the judiciary? And, you know, Oregon's kind of the right size unit for that. It'd be hard to do a similar conversation in California or Florida or New York, but, a, a, you know, moderate sized state with a, a nice anchor land grant university law school, you, you ought to be able to have that conversation. And, and it was a very positive conversation. Similarly, Andy Perlman at, at Suffolk the other day, they had a great meeting where they're talking about the innovation that's happening there. So I think, I think there are, you know, uh, uh, some of you I'm sure are inveterate Maoists, I perhaps am not, but a thousand flowers are blooming across the law school world, and that's good, law world. Not all of them will, will prove to, to work, but I think to the extent that we can observe them, highlight them, share them, replicate those, you know, positive deviants. I'm going to use that Mike's line again and probably forget it was his and, uh, you know, I'll think it was mine. But uh, uh, I think there's a lot of that going on and it's all good. And because the gap is so obvious and to, you know, frankly, everybody outside of the kind of core world of law schools that there's a gap between kind of is and should, that there's plenty of opportunities to fill that gap. You know, I would, I would you know, a little uh, congratulatory comment here. So I don't know, there's 500 people in this room Saturday morning after, you know, two days after New Year's, Washington, D.C. I mean, this is not, you know, you may think this is a boondoggle, but uh, there are those who don't. So <laughs> the, 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 it, that shows the level of commitment and passion for the enterprise. I mean, the American law school is a critical enterprise. The success of the, of the mission of the institution is very high. You know, are we 1% or 15% off where we ought to be? It doesn't really matter, you know, how critical we want to be of the status quo. If, if 500 people are willing to sit in a room and think about how to do better on a, you know, rainy Saturday on New Year's weekend, that shows uh, a tremendous basis for optimism because solving these problems, not, it is not Fermat's last theorem here. This is not, these are not really that hard of problems to solve if people are engaged and committed, and I think your presence evinces that. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic. Thank you. So I want to take just a few minutes for what I'll call a lightning round. And I'm going to just we're going to go down the row, and this is under the heading impediments to innovation. And just sort of if you could reflect very briefly on on you know I'll mention a word, <laughs> and and sort of tell me whether you think these these are or are not impediments and how how they might be actualized. So I'll, so begin with cost. Marty. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't have to be. It uh, it certainly can be, but it doesn't have to be the. Uh, you know, one, one of the things about uh, uh, being in, in, in this world is, is that we're pretty good problem solvers. Um, also, I would say that, that uh, focusing on cost alone is, is, is probably not the best way to, to think about innovation. It, it's in terms of value. So, uh, you know, I, I, from a cost perspective, it means that, that 
we certainly need to focus on, on what are the highest value innovations, what are the things that are going uh, to, to make students want to come to us, employers want to hire our, our students. Um, it's not just about cost. I agree 100% with what Marty just said. And I wanted to add that this, I would give the same answer at the level of the individual faculty member as well as at the level of the school or the program. I think the, uh, the cost that I worry about sometimes is diversion of attention from core um, pursuits of legal education. As you know, there's a lot right with what we do. And so just being careful in terms of cost with time and priorities and understanding that, you know, while, you know, we don't want to be, you know, look over here, look over here at all the shiny gold stuff while, meanwhile, you know, our students need to continue to, you know, advance in the, the core of, of legal education. Uh, the, the language uh, I like in the world these days is the notion of design, which has kind of been popularized by Stanford and is now sort of taken over. And both. I have two daughters who took the design classes, one on the West Coast, one on the East Coast. So the, the essence of any design problem is constraint. So cost is always a constraint. An unconstrained problem is not a problem. So okay, get over it. There's always going to be cost as a constraint. If, if you're solving a problem that's of interest to someone, there ought to be a stakeholder that you can find outside your immediate resource base that would be willing to provide resources. And you know, most of the time when people start by iterate, articulating what the constraint is, what they're really saying is they don't care enough about the problem to want to solve it, which is totally legitimate, right? You could say, look, this is a dumb problem. I don't think you can solve it. But to just say, well, there's a constraint, therefore we can't solve it, that's probably not the, you know, worthy of the intellectual caliber of people in the American law school. Right. Faculty is my next one. Marty, you're up. <laughs> faculty is definitely, uh, in fact, not a, a constraint. Uh, it's a, faculty is essential to getting any of these problems solved. Uh, but the key to doing that is having faculty uh, understand themselves as part, understand the problem, and understand themselves as, as part of the solution. The way to uh, th that, I, that I tend to think about this, and it's to be. To, to be really blunt about it, it's when faculty understand uh, the importance of a particular innovation uh, to everyone in the building keeping their jobs, uh, that gets people really focused on, on being part of innovating and, and solving these problems. So one thing I didn't talk about when I talked about successes and failures is this. A year and a half ago, I was asked by our dean to chair a dean's task force on innovation in our legal in our, in our program of legal education, and I won't talk about any of the mechanics except that, uh, or, or the outcomes, except that uh, faculty are not an undifferentiated uh, sort of group of commodities, right? We all know this. Uh, you have on any given law school faculty a range of, of temperaments, tastes, uh, inclinations, constraints, to use uh, Paul's uh, design metaphor, uh, everything from people who are extremely, extremely committed to their existing program of scholarship teaching and service to people who are in one way or another positive deviance on various aspects of the scale. And so when you're thinking about innovation at the institutional level, you really need to think carefully about who it is you're talking about collaborating with from the faculty standpoint, who is likely to be interested in undertaking innovations of one sort or another on their own or in response to different kinds of uh, incentives or other structures. I think my answer to this is the usual one with faculty that can be heaven or hell. Um, and that is in that when I think about the innovations that have most thrived, I would say they're due in each instance to an outstanding faculty member who has really taken that on and, and really run with it and uh, has done just a great job. The other issue I see with faculty though is that one of the impediments to innovation is when colleagues don't trust each other or they don't trust the uh, administration of the law school to create the space for innovation. And so when faculty think that every person in the school has to be doing exactly the same thing, and or they get suspicious of, well, why does he get to do X, and why is, you know, this one course release for that, and, you know, that can really be an impediment. And so trying to really build that culture where people will 
um, create that space for people to try some new things and to have some room to do that because I think one of the misperceptions that sometimes we have about innovation is that we think of it as being something that one day like a lightning bolt to the brain. It's not really that. Innovation is work. It's 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration, I think, in many cases. And so, you know, one must have the, uh, the kind of institutional structure where there's room and trust for that uh, to flourish. Yeah, uh, two, two uh, uh, anecdotoids. So a couple of years ago, Elena Kagan was speaking a thing, and, and she, I went to elementary school with her. So I said, Elena, I hear you guys are thinking about moving across the river. And before I could even finish the question, she said, oh, no, 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 don't worry about it. I'm like, I'm not worried about it. I think that's the best thing you could possibly do because Rodriguez is right. You, you need to be a law and, and, and it would be great for the law school to repot itself, move across the river next to the business school and emerging stuff that's happening in the sciences. But the instinct of the law school is to simply maintain the status quo and not discomfort any of the current stakeholders. So I was troubled by that. Conversely, Jonathan Zittrain is there now, and he's building you know, the new um, uh, library of Alexandria. They're, they've got a machine where they, they take every book that's in there. Hey, just, you're welcome to come to any of my sessions if you're really the laugh at a joke of that caliber. So the other <laughs> they have a giant, a giant machine where they're taking every book, taking it out of the binder, copying it, digitizing it, converting it to HTML, and so they're going to have, you know, basically the super digital library on steroids, which conceivably will make the jobs, it will make the jobs of most of your librarians both richer, but also in some cases harder to sustain. So I think that's a fabulous innovation. So, you know, some people want to preserve the status quo. Some people want to do dynamic new things. That's just the way it is. It's obvious that if you have a governance model that requires a super majoritarian decision or you have faculty members who have tenure who will snipe at you for doing something different, you know, that's a, that's a, a formula for the status quo and for high blood pressure. Okay, it is what it is. That ain't going to change. So just acknowledge that that's a structural issue and, and makes it relatively more difficult to do new things. You still got to do whatever is the right thing to do for the institution. Two more in my lightning round, but I'll start with Kelly on this one. So Marty doesn't have to start first. Rankings. <laughs> Kelly. This, and remember that this is a light, the, the context, obstacles to innovation. Are they, to what extent, you know, so rankings. You know, I, I don't think I think that it is an obstacle. Um, I think there's plenty of room. I mean, you know, I, I'm very fond sometimes of saying if I had, you know, three wishes in the world, I'd do something about world peace, world hunger, and then get rid of U.S. news. Uh, so it's not that I love that institution, um, but uh, I, I do think that I can't think of, a, of something that we've wanted to do where that's been the reason we haven't been able to, to pursue it. Paul? Yeah, it's a tricky problem because the structure of the U.S. news means that most things that are useful and new won't be reflected in the short term. So, so that's an excuse for people who don't want to do anything. It's a constraint for people who are highly constrained. But if you really believe that what you're doing is the right thing, then you, you should go forth and do it. I mean, the U.S. news entered a vacuum which we collectively created, right? And sooner or later, something else will fill that vacuum. Um, if you think it's a profoundly logical system, then you should get up every morning and bow down to it. If you don't, then you should do what you think is right and then assume that over time greater wisdom will prevail. Mike? I've had the good fortune to ignore uh, the impact of what I've been doing at our, our Innovation Practice Institute on our law school standing in the rankings. Uh, I have built this program entirely, as Paul said, because I thought it was the right thing to do for our students and the right thing to do for our community. Uh, and so far, the reaction from the students has been extremely positive, and the reaction to date so far from the community, both the legal employers and the business and nonprofit communities, has been extremely positive as well. Uh, I, am, I am trusting that over the long run, uh, that will uh, positively impact the status and standing of the law school as well. So, it, <coughs> so rankings certainly don't have to be an impediment. They, uh, they can be, though, in, in two important respects, uh, but, but they're easily actually overcome. Uh, the first is to the extent that, uh, that rankings are a force toward uh, homogeneity, right? And the idea is if you look at the very top of, of U.S. news and you say, oh, well, uh, any of us who want to move that direction then have to look more like those schools at the top, that, that 
sort of creates a pressure toward homogeneity, um, which is the antithesis of innovation, right? The whole point of innovation is to find something that differentiates you uh, and try and get really good at it, and, and that's what will, will hopefully uh, sort of create change. Uh, the second way in which uh, U.S. news can be an impediment, but again, doesn't have to, uh, is to the extent that it discourages cooperation between law schools. Uh, if, if we all see ourselves in a zero-sum game, um, then we are not the best we can be. Law schools are inherently open source, uh, so there's, there's a lot of benefits to sharing knowledge, uh, but I'd say it's even worth going beyond that and cooperating. We have a, a, uh, a cool project we're doing with uh, Phil Weiser and the University of Colorado Law School uh, where we put together a statewide uh, legal residency program modeled after the, the medical model that, uh, that, that Paul's talking about uh, for people their first year out of law school. Uh, if, if we were just doing this for, you know, and, and thinking about U.S. news would say, well, we don't want to do anything to, to, to help the competition, but there's a whole lot of good that, that's uh, come out of, out of that sort of collaboration. All right, last one, and let's start with Mike. Regulation. I said one word, but that could be ABA, AALS, State Bar, regulation. So this has been, as, as we all know, uh, it's probably the most timely and, and sort of topical of the, of the lightning round topics. Uh, again, I think I would echo Marty's point about the pressures to homogeneity. The, 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 uh, the new ABA uh, standards, particularly the ABA standards about experiential learning and hours uh, for graduation, uh, obviously a topic on, on pretty much everybody's mind in a very urgent way. And, and, and the challenge uh, for us, as for many people, is taking a lot of things that we do at our school. And again, I focused when I described our IPI on the fact that what we are doing is providing non-curricular experiential opportunities for our students. Therefore, those are not going to count towards the ABA mandate uh, regarding graduation. So what do we do about that? Do we, re do we tweak our IPI programming in a way that requires, com that, that provides compliance with the ABA standards, but arguably compromises the, the vision of education and career development that we're trying to implement, or do we go to the ABA and, and ask for some kind of accommodation or exception uh, that might allow us to continue to experiment with and refine our program because we believe it actually is more likely to pay off in terms of career opportunities for our students. Um, I think a lot of law schools, a lot of faculties are wrestling with sort of comparable kinds of things. So I think regulation is, for reasons similar to what Marty described, uh, a minute ago, uh, very much a, a potential constraint on this. Kelly? Um, I, I've been very pleased to see the ABA's move toward more diversity within law schools and, and, and encouraging law schools to embrace their own mission and, uh, and so to the degree that that trend continues, I think I don't see that being, you know, a huge bar to innovation. One of the regulatory uh, concerns I have is more at the state bar level, as more and more state bars are getting into the business of, of saying, you know, law schools should do X or Y in their curriculum, including skills hours and particular kinds of skills. I think that's a much greater regulatory uh, concern for, for innovation. Paul? Yeah, so the, uh, as I think several people said, uh, uh, maybe Kelly most eloquently, we have to you know, we're competing in a global economy. The expectation is that we can deliver more value and reduce the cost. To the extent that w there are regulations that, that make that harder to do, you know, we, we are the regulators. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a lame excuse. So we can go to the regulators, Barry Courier or whomever, and say, look, these, we, we need some flexibility. For example, the, the ABA, I don't know exactly what group, you know, came up with some standards around distance learning a year or two ago. So William Mitchell has got a great program they're rolling out, I think maybe this month, uh, for distance learning. That's great. Who else is doing distance learning? I don't know. You know, the, so the, we, again, we tend to, you know, be less than candid and we cite constraints, external constraints, as opposed to saying, well, we don't really want to do anything different. We'll just fess up, you know, and do anything different, and that's that. But I, I, I'd be shocked if a room full of lawyers can't figure out a way to manage the regulations if those regulations make law school less valuable and more expensive. I, mean, I reckon we can, we can probably solve that problem. Marty? Not much to add to that. I'd just uh, sort of fall on from what, what Paul's saying. It, it really is easy uh, and, and sort of standard fare for law school deans and to, to blame the ABA for and, and the regulations for uh, why we can't do things. But frankly, if, if you look at it, there are very, very few times 
uh, when it, you can point to an ABA regulation and, and sort of say, well, because of that, we can't solve this problem. We're pretty good problem solvers. Um, I, too, worry about the, uh, the plethora of state regulations because it, it just makes it, uh, in fact, harder uh, for any given law school to make sure it, it, it multiplies the, the number of regulatory issues that you just have to think about. And so many of them, they're, they're, they tend to be motivated by all the best of, of intentions, right, where we really want to make sure that we're providing this great education for all of our students and all of our future lawyers. Um, but, but way too often, it, the, the regulations, uh, particularly at the state level, uh, fail to acknowledge that one person's law school experience is, is not necessarily someone else's, and, and those uh, uh, do create a, a pressure toward homogeneity, which I, I think we need to, uh, to avoid. With the inclusion of the lightning round, let me uh, open it up to, uh, to, to the audience. I don't know if we have 500 folks here, but there are <laughs> hundreds in any event, so, and I'm sure they're, so let me move the mic back to. Can folks identify themselves? Yeah, yeah. you wouldn't mind identifying yourself, too. Yeah, um, Mark Hall, Wake Forest University, and uh, I'd <laughs> just be interested to hear more about innovation of, in the non-JD space. programs that expand beyond the, the traditional missions of law school. If you haven't heard in the back, is, uh, Mark asked about innovations in the non-JD in the non -JD, JD, uh, space. Well, I'll, I'll jump in on that. We have, uh, this is not Man Bites Dog, a new Master of Science and Law program. It's a little bit more like a man biting a dog in that it's uh, our particular program is, uh, is, uh, is a program that uh, is designed exclusively for uh, scientists, engineers, and medical professionals. It's a, it's a one-year program or a or longer program on a part-time basis. The requirement is, uh, there's no admissions test or all, but the requirement is substantial STEM training. We enrolled a class, this is at Northwestern, this year with 30 uh, students. And uh, it's a remarkably a diverse class. There are PhDs in biochemistry, folks uh, who have been very uh, substantially in the, in the patent space and IP inventors. Uh, a good uh, chunk of those students are from around the world. They're, they're uh, uh, both an opportunity and a challenge to teach. I'll say that, having taught a six-week mini course on everything about the legal and the regulatory process. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, but that is, that's one innovation that we've, uh, that we've undertaken in, uh, in the, uh, the non-JD space. Dan, let me mention one that's a, a little bit different, I think. Um, I think a lot of law schools have moved into the master's degree in law. We've done that in law and public policy. It'll start next fall. Uh, but one of the interesting programs that I found in Washington is that Washington was the first state to create what's called a limited license legal technician. So designed to be, a, you know, to do some uh, work in the, in the legal space uh, without an actual JD degree. And that's something that I think a lot of states are looking at, as I understand it. Um, and certainly Washington moved that direction out of access to justice concerns that too many people in areas like family law especially uh, were being unrepresented. And so we've developed the curriculum for that uh, program. And it's a largely online curriculum. And it's been really interesting to us to see the people from all over the state, you know, some people will go to a computer terminal in a courthouse to, you know, take this program and become, you know, educated. And so I want to mention both at the master's level, but also I think many more states are going to start to examine whether uh, a change like that is, is appropriate given access to justice concerns. Uh, let me put in a plug for my good friend uh, Bill Henderson. I don't think it's here in this room, but it's, I believe, here. So Henderson's got a great presentation now about growth in the legal market, and essentially, you know, I think the, the, the market as we've traditionally understood it for first-year lawyers straight from law school into kind of full-time law office environments, that, that at best is going to be a flat market. But the growth is going to be this law and market. Law. So law, the value of law and the, you know, what I've called embedded law, law as part of a, other systems is, is very high and will continue to grow. And so the, the, I, I think there's tremendous opportunity. You know, frankly, if, if I had three big banks in my state, I'd, I'd be thinking about them or, or other large employers. So the, the growth in employment will be in the non-traditional setting, non-law non law office specific traditional settings, figuring out that, you know, is that program 
like the thing we tried to do at Stanford? Eh, probably not. Is it a one-year program, a night school for people? You know, quite possibly. Will many things attempt to do it and fail? Most likely, you know, you'll have to do some experimentation. But, but law as a, as a meta system in society where most professionals will benefit from having some exposure to it is very high. And obviously, the, if I'm a, a platform law school, that, that I ought to think of that as my natural opportunity. You know, figuring out precisely how that's going to work, getting your faculty to do it, defining the curriculum, those are not easy problems. But I would think, you know, Thank willing you. minds can solve them. Can I, Marty wants to say something, but I just want to, just as a footnote to what Paul said, which I think is a very important point, this is not an excuse not to do it. On the contrary, I think that's exactly right. A bit of a headwind, though, is, is whether you see this on the blogosphere, you see that in the media and others, is the narrative, in some sense, a counter-narrative, the narrative that basically this debate about the so-called JD advantage versus JD required. The more we succumb, I say sort of we collectively, to that narrative that basically what uh, law students coming to law school and, and receiving jo jo so-called jobs for which a JD is an advantage, not a requirement, the more it makes it difficult from a, from, a, from a competitive rankings perspective to implement those programs. So Paul's exactly right, that's the trend, but that trend is bumping up against folks who are day after day after day saying, see, these, these money-grubbing law schools are basically taking your money and not even providing you jobs that are JD required jobs. Working at Starbucks is like working for HBSC, and that's just not, this is not the case. So I was just gonna say, uh, the, the, the way I like to think about uh, LLMs and, and, and the graduate space is a little bit broader in, in terms of unbundling legal education, right? If you think about it, we offer a product called a JD, which is a collection of, of classes, which then, you know, obviously uh, is necessary to, to licensure for the JD required jobs. Uh, but there's all sorts of people who uh, could use some forms of legal education. That's why, uh, as, as Kelly points out, there's, uh, you know, opportunities in, in spaces around these legal technician, uh, you know, initiatives. Um, there are, uh, for the, there are, uh, opportunities around uh, law and business, uh, sort of the, the business of law and, and, and practice. There are opportunities around uh, the law and space that don't necessarily involve JD degrees. There's, there's a whole lot of people out there who can benefit from the type of product that we provide at law schools uh, who may not want a JD or who may already have a JD. And so it's thinking about uh, graduate programs or, or non-JD programs in terms of niches. One of the, the problems that law schools have fallen into uh, or had fallen into was this notion that we'll just start this general LLM program and it will be this magical thing that, that our provosts keep talking about in terms of the, uh, the holy grail of alternative revenue streams. Um, they don't just materialize. It's a matter of finding a niche, finding a need uh, for the types of programming that law schools do particularly well. Um, and trying to find whether it's degree programs or certificate programs or things other than the JD that, that allow us to provide that to people who could use it. So this, I think, is sort of thematically related to particularly what Marty just said. And, and I want to make the point that innovation comes in different scales, right? So innovation can be kind of a large programmatic intervention and modification of a program, or innovation can be in a very small, micro, you know, classroom specific or, you know, very, very, you know, it starts small, it becomes bigger, or it starts small and it falls on its face or whatever. But you can experiment in a lot of different ways, which is partly a way of basically empowering everybody who wishes to to sort of experiment on their own, which is how I got into this uh, sort of IPI-ish kind of stuff. So here's my example of something that doesn't yet rise to the level of a certificate or a joint degree or an LLM or something like that. But my IPI program gives me sort of a platform and permission to do a variety of things. So two years ago, I started teaching a leadership development course uh, to law students, although I also, I, I publicize it throughout the building, so I, I invite faculty to come, I invite members of the professional staff of the law school to come. It's five nights a week, five nights during the dead of winter, so people don't often have a lot of other things going on in Pittsburgh um, in February uh, in the evening, two hours in the evening. Uh, I've done leadership development stuff outside of law, which is what I'm importing into this. It's completely extracurricular. No one who comes gets any kind of academic credit. I manufacture kind of a, a you know, a, a construction paper certificate 
certificate to deliver to people because they like the gold star at the end of all of this. And it's conceivable, I have a vision of expanding these, these, these five week, 10 hour modules across the entirety of the academic year to provide some of the more structured uh, professional development training that Kelly, I think, mentioned at the outset that clearly the, the legal and business market needs more of from our graduates. But right now, it's this very micro kind of intervention uh, that may, over time, grow into something more formal. Great. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, Teresa Kaiser, American University, Washington College of Law. Everybody here Not in the working? back? Just, uh, no. So, we, sorry, because just so forward, if okay. you could, yeah. Can we turn this way and ask a question? Can you hear me? Sure. Okay. Whatever. It's not, I think it's. Why don't you take the mic like karaoke and just kind of. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. Give a TED talk. Go ahead. <laughs> Teresa Kaiser, American University, Washington College of Law. So um, one of the areas where we've spent a lot of our effort in this innovation is with the globalization of our JD student population. Uh, in particular, one of the programs that we do are our international JD dual degree programs. So students earn a JD from us simultaneously a practicing level law degree in, in a foreign country. You, you spoke earlier about m m um, melding JD degrees with other master's level degrees, but this is uh, obviously a slightly different twist on that. And I'm curious whether this is an area, um, that sort of the globalization of the JD population, perhaps through dual degree programs, international JD dual degree programs, or other areas where you're doing in innovative um, projects or see opportunity for that. I'll start. Um, absolutely. And it's an interesting um, point because, I mean, I do think both at the JD level, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, we're also seeing a lot of opportunity in the LLM level to do joint degrees with schools around the world, and it's uh, very interesting. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, my sense is there's a, a lot of opportunity there and it really does, it's a very different experience if the students are really working together, you know, in, in that way. It brings up for me another regulatory obstacle that we didn't mention, and that's our universities. And so there's a lot of regulations around graduate education and what you can give credit for and what you can't. And so I just want to mention that because I think this is a great way to go. Uh, fortunately, my vice dean, Pat Kuzler, is great at running interference on a lot of those, those uh, areas, but, uh, but that is a, a key obstacle uh, for some of that, I, I think, real good ideas to do. Just on the particular, I mean, it's a great question. On, on the particulars of the international education space, here's where, speaking for myself as a dean with, with a fairly robust international cohort, I'd benefit from the wisdom of the crowds. One thing that strikes me, the more I travel, travel internationally and talk to particularly folks in law firms, principally about our JD, pro, our, sorry, our LLM program, is the attention quickly turns to what is on offer in the JD space, as at America and as at Northwestern and other places. So it really is remarkable how the attention has shifted. And my, you know, again, my, my sense is probably a lot of reasons for that, but two loom large. One is, quite frankly, there's been a plethora of so many foreign LLM programs that in many parts of the world, there's a real quality control issue. It's not to say that a bunch of them are bad quality. It's just they feel, whether they're in Shanghai or Mexico City or Buenos Aires, they don't know how to, how to navigate and negotiate the various levels of quality. And number two, and probably more, much more important than number one, is simply the credentialing that a JD, uh, JD uh, provides. Uh, and that, along with, as a footnote, the tightening up of requirements of the New York Bar and all of the in-the-weeds sort of issues, are putting a lot of spotlight on the possibility and the prospect of shifting uh, for, uh, to a JD model. So that'll be really interesting to see. And I really invite you know, folks, probably another panel for another time, another place, is really this intersection of the LLM and the JD with respect to the foreign, foreign population. Yeah, over there, just please. Or you do what sort of innovation things do you see going on as far as career 
just for the purpose of the recording, the question is, what do we see in innovation in career services and career placement? Um, so again, I'll, I'll give a plug for a friend of mine. So Bruce McEwen has a new service called JD Match, which attempts to match employers um, and, uh, and law students and reduce the cost of on-campus recruiting. And re so, so, I mean, step back. We, we, by and large, we're a community of self-described progressives who believe in objectivity and we have a performance measurement system that's completely reputational based and I would say entirely regressive. So, uh, okay, this is, we could probably do better than that, I think, you know, thinking if we put our hearts to the problem. So, so having, having a very, you know, attenuated notions of performance either in law school or in practice is a problem, we can do better. Having hiring strictly on the basis of of a credentialing filtering system is not very progressive. You might say, some people might say it's objective. I don't know. Um, so, so how do we connect uh, students with performance, and how do we we help employers understand performance better? Um, uh, you know, that's a, maybe a big problem. But redu create, reducing the boundary between the school and the employer and the ultimate stakeholder, the client, is is part of that process. And uh, they're now. JD Match is one, I'm sure there are other services that would facilitate that. So I'd, I'd say that there's sort of two ways in, in which I think that we absolutely need to innovate in, in the career space. Um, the first is in terms of the, as, as you mentioned, involving faculty. Uh, it is imperative at this point that all of us as faculty members uh, be involved in the guerrilla warfare that is getting our students jobs, um, whether it's writing letters, it's, it's the network. I mean, if, if you're not getting, you know, if you're not getting jobs because of the credentials, uh, you're largely getting them because of the network. The second thing is that there is, and, and this goes back to this, this uh, sort of notion of the role of the community and the law schools together, there's a huge educational piece. We had this, uh, in, in, in this foundations program uh, at Educating Tomorrow's Lawyers, we went out and we had this totally eye-opening session where we gave potential employers a whole set of resumes and sort of ask them, you know, what, what about them stood out and that sort of thing. And here we are in law schools thinking all about, oh, experiential education, you know, the Carnegie Report says, uh, you know, that, that, that this is really useful stuff. It makes, it responds to what we hear from the law firms and, and, and legal offices about uh, what they need out of our grads. And we had people sort of look at it and say, well, I don't know what a clinic does. I, you know, I don't see how that, rep that relates to what I need, you know, if, if someone, that's representing poor people, that's, you know, I represent rich people, that's, there's no uh, sort of transition between those, those things, and so um, that means that as, as faculty members uh, and, and, and uh, in addition to our career services folks, um, and our students have to be part of this too, there has to be a, a sort of educational component to what we do uh, so that we can get law firms and, and legal uh, offices beyond the well, I don't like the way our hiring works, but I'm going to stick with, you know, where they law review at such and such a school. Two qu very quick follow-ups, uh, both kind of low-tech, but I think they work. One is that I, I continue to think one of the most, um, in most law schools, the collaboration internally that's still underutilized is between career services and alumni relations and advancement. And so trying to really knit those together. And on that score, if you can just simply get everyone in your building to help alumni relations keep their database updated about who's where, because so many faculty, librarians, staff, et cetera, are in touch with graduates, and that database does not get updated automatically. And so just getting people to think about that and get that information you know, in so that those two things can be knit together operationally. Oh, were you going to jump in on this one? No, please don't. I, I was going to go back to the previous one. So no, let me, let me follow up on yeah. this one. Um, so polite. <laughs> our closest working relationships, our closest partnerships um, among our innovation program and other constituencies around the campus and around the law school are with career services and with alumni relations and advancement. Uh, so uh, our, I'm very happy to say that our career services or career development 
uh, function at our law school has been completely reworked and retooled over the last four years to get away from the sort of pipeline system of bringing law firm employers onto campus and having law students submit to interviews and sort of get jobs that way. It's much more relationship based. I call it concierge career development. It's very individualized, right? Um, so we spend a lot of time, my, my executive director colleague and I, working with our, our career development uh, head and her three chief deputies, and who all, each of whom have covered different areas of the professional domains that our students might end up working with. Uh, we have them come speak to our students through IPI programs. We sort of counsel our students on how to interact with them. But this is the not so secret secret of my sort of community partnership based model, which is you put your students out into the community, that's generating the kind of relationships that will ultimately lead to internships, externships, summer jobs, and permanent employment. Um, that's really the, the game plan. Now, what what we have to do is, is from the, the teaching side is backfill in terms of preparing the students to succeed uh, in that environment. Same thing with, with institutional advancement. We actually work more closely with the university level IA team than with what we've got inside the law school. We have a weekly lunch and learn program for our students. We're bringing alumni and other interesting people from the legal world out into the law school to meet with our students. We usually get 20 to 25 students to show up. We just feed them pizza. Um, but about half the time our guest speakers are people people who we recruit through IA. Paul, do you have something quick on that? Just, yeah, if I yeah. go back to the previous question on uh, international education. So it's a no-brainer that the law's share of global GDP will grow faster than GDP will grow, and that that will dominantly be Anglo-American law, and therefore the core knowledge educational institution for that is the American law school, because the English law schools are not competitive. Having said that, there's a, you know, sort of an elephant in the room, which is probably the single biggest competitive threat to American law school, which is the, the deregulation of the UK legal market versus the US, the so-called ABS, or alternative business structure rules, it means that there's a lot more innovation right now in the UK market, uh, both at the large law firm level and at the disruptor level, which means most of the growth of legal services will be outside the United States. So if UK institutions capture a disproportionate share of that market opportunity because the regulatory structure is more suited to it, that will be a disadvantage to the American law school. So a bigger threat to y'all than the U.S. news, which is just is what it is, and all the other problems is the fact that the U.S. is still has a backwards state-by-state uh, -state regulatory structure, and the U.K. is going to capture a disproportionate share of global legal services and global legal knowledge unless we change that. And if you really want to be even madder at the U.K. <laughs> or, or uh, realpolitik, Notice they're also entering the LLM space, competition for LLM students, as Australia is, yep. with Verve. Yeah. Sir, please. I'm Ved Nanda at the University of Denver Law School. Um, as a student of international law, um, I was obviously disappointed that uh, your innovative <laughs> effort did not succeed. Um, I think uh, you probably have thought about it much better than I that uh, today's market uh, as student is looking for a job and bar exams and bar exams don't have international law, comparative law in it. And so a student feels disappointed and cheated that uh, he or she has got to take that class in the first year. Yeah. Um, just uh, to give you a background and context, um, I have taught uh, first year international law students at the University of Denver not on the coast, and had more than 100 students optional, not uh, that uh, required in that class year after year after year. Um, I think at the present time, you know better than again I do, Michigan, Harvard, many other places, they have started on transnational <laughs> law. Also, the effort has been in order to introduce international law in all courses in first year, contracts, towards, you name it, right. because in this era of globalization, international comparative aspects, they pervade the whole sphere. And, and so I think in terms of innovation, we can think about international law in all these different kind of aspects. In the transnational law area, where globalization matters, in different uh, uh, subject areas, international comparative, aspects to be introduced, and I don't think that we need to give up on international law, because that's my job. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, let me just say, we, we have not given up, and um, we'll, if, uh, at the risk of making Marty mad, we'll talk after the program. <laughs> Thank you. Please. Jennifer Droback, Indiana McKinney. I'd like to know about innovation with respect to the cultivation and tenuring of law professors. And specifically, I, r I understand that there are institutional problems, but as we move into high tech and as we are getting away from, and it, it seems that the law professional um, in the academic level has been an impediment to I innovation. So how do we promote, cultivate, and tenure law professors who are going to be innovation-minded but still cultivate them? Because you cannot participate, you can't get to the level of doing online unless you've already produced all those law review articles. So thanks. Great, thank you for that. So the first is, is understanding, uh, the, the first thing I'd say there is, is, is key to understand all the different parts of the job. And if, if our goal is to create, for example, innovation in the classroom, uh, we have to understand that, that just in our system that has to be balanced with uh, with, with the other parts of the job of, of getting in, and uh, it's not that you have to keep tenure, but most of us are, are sort of the type A personalities that want to keep justifying uh, tenure, so that's important. The, the second thing I'd say is it's really important to provide space to fail. Um, you know, as, as Paul mentioned earlier, right, most innovation by its own nature uh, fails, and, and you can do this, uh, for example, uh, you know, you can do so in, in little ways, but they do matter. So for example, uh, if, a, if a law professor wants to teach a new course, whether it's an online course or an experiential course, and they fail spectacularly, uh, I won't count those evaluations, uh, the, the student evaluations toward the, uh, you know, toward their evaluation for that year. I'll essentially give them a one-year pass. You screw up the second year, it's on you. But um, it, it's just little things like that. But it, it, you know, I, I think the bigger principle here is uh, you do have to provide space to fail because otherwise innovation won't happen. I just also say apropos something Paul said before about about credentialing in the in the job space. It's also even though it's it's, it's a very mini, of course, uh, cohort here in the uh, in the uh, academic space, looking for other criteria. I mean, looking for distinguished uh, abilities, but also folks who might have worked in the GC's office or worked in in you know in in uh, in areas, you know, not the Solicitor General's office necessarily, or not this or that, not instead of, but in addition to, and widening the the sort of the scope of, of uh, where we look for our law faculty. That's true. Oh, excuse me. You have somebody just. Donna Coker, um, University of Miami. Um, I, I wanted to raise one issue that I don't think you've talked about, and that's law student debt and the cost of legal education and, and try to marry that with something you have mentioned, and that's access to justice. And, and I'm wondering if you think that the federal loan forgiveness program, um, not perfect, but it's there, is a way to sort of build some innovation around that. In other words, encouraging students to develop uh, practices that would allow them to take advantage of that loan forgiveness uh, program that exists. And, and if that's not helpful, what do we need to do um, at the federal level to change that program to make it more useful so that law students, people with JDs, can begin to fill those, um, that gap for uh, low bono, if you will? Yeah. Can I start, Dan? Please. I think that's a really great question, and um, and one of the things I would say about it is this: I think most of us experience the fact that many more of our students want to work in public interest or low bono work than than can find positions and places to do that, and so we realize what a, this is a perfect innovation opportunity because what we really need to help them become are entrepreneurs to create their own. Uh, you know, space to do this work. And so one of the things we've started to think about is how can we help our graduates do that? And I know that, you know, some schools have created some incubators for that to happen, where they're provided some office space, you know, early on. I think that's a great idea. We've provided a couple fellowships where people that wanted to form their own nonprofits could do that within, you know, and, and get the support of, of, you know, the school in, in ways to, to see that happen. So. That's a, a wonderful question to just remember that, you know, innovation that helps create jobs is something that, that 
that's what our graduates really need because of the way the funding structure, you know, works. It's, it's just, uh, you know, there are too few out there that one can just, just obtain. And just one sentence, the, the best thing, most essential sort of twin aims with respect to IBR and pay in particular is one, maintain it against ever-growing threats uh, to, to, to wipe it out. And the second is to publicize it. It's really remarkable how, how despite the many years in operation, there's still, still under, under understanding on the part of schools and, and students about, about the program. But I, but I emphasize the first. It is, as, as many of you know, most of you know, maybe all of you know by now, it's under relentless threat from both sides of the aisle. So if I just added one thing to complement what Kelly said, uh, which is we've talked a bit about creating space in the law school program for faculty and the program to innovate on the faculty side, but I think sort of part and parcel of what Kelly's saying about creating opportunities for students to do these sort of different sorts of things in terms of their careers is to create space for students and to create the imagination and vision on the student side to tell them and communicate to them that this is actually possible, which is not only a structural problem, it's also a cognitive problem. And so this is a big role that innovation in and out of the classroom can play is teaching students that not only are the opportunities there from a financial standpoint, but the, the opportunities are there to build your life around this kind of, of engagement with the community. And I would just simply add, don't, don't exclude the community from this. Uh, it, it, we, we hardly have an, a, a monopoly on innovation at the law schools, um, but we can provide space for people who are innovators in the community. So for example, in this uh, legal residency program that uh, we created in between the two Colorado schools, it turns out that there's a, a couple people in the community who said, gee, maybe we can use that program to help staff low bono type law firms and put together a financial model that's workable for that. Um, so, so just make sure that, that the community is part of those efforts too. I'm Luke Bierman from Elon University School of Law in North Carolina. Um, this has been very interesting, and thank you for doing this. Thanks for putting it together. Um, after an hour and a half almost, there's been almost no conversation about the cost of what we do to the student. And I wonder if you could comment on the relationship innovation cost and what that really goes to is the business model that we're operating under and perhaps could in the future. I, I wonder if you could just speak to that briefly. Let me, let me begin because one of the things that I, I mentioned but may not have emphasized enough is that I find it you know, very difficult to want to say to students, we're going to take your tuition money and experiment on various things, right? That's not, you know, nobody feels good about that. Um, and so I think this is one of the areas where um, finding the community partners, finding uh, ways to get startup funds to, to try some of these innovative areas is really critical. And, and also what goes along with that is in finding some startup funding, we all know that doesn't last forever, right? And so one of the things that I think innovation means is that we have to all start thinking about revenue, not just expense and spending and doing things, but how do you couple a revenue generation aspect with the new thing that you're doing? So can you couple it with a new LLM program, for example? Uh, can it be doing, you know, CLEs or whatever it might be that, that then is a, reven a source of revenue support? That might also be gifts and grants. You know, one of the things that we've really seen grow are the number of grants our faculty are getting. And the way that happens is not because law is funded more as law, but because of this embeddedness that you mentioned. That so many fields, if you partner with other fields, there is grant funding for a project that includes law. And so I think that, you know, many faculty members in the university are very used to finding their own salary. In legal education, we haven't been used to that, but I think it's something that more and more we need to start to think about so that we are being smart about uh, the resource part of, of innovation. And I want to say a word about fundraising, particularly the number of deans up here on the panel and many in the audience. There's a real, there's a real puzzle about fundraising uh, from, from alums. You're basically asking alums to give generously to law school to, in their minds, change the law school in some fundamental ways for when, when they were there. And it doesn't mean that they're selfish or conservative or anything like that. To, to, you know, to, to, it's, a different, it's a different conversation, right, to, to really ask them to, to support significant innovation. But, but it may seem like a tangent, but it directly goes, I think, to Luke's question, because the bottom line is we can't just use recycled tuition dollars. As Kelly says, it has to come, come from the outside. Let's take both questions in tandem, because they've been staying there patiently, and then we'll, 
then we'll be, there'll be our final questions. Sharon Wright Paulson from the University of Minnesota. To take a little detour and ask, does marketing play a role in the success of innovation or in how, innova or in how success is defined or perceived? And if so, how do you manage that or provide for that? Great. Hi, Andy Perlman from Suffolk Law School. Paul, thanks for the shout out. All I think uh, pairing with Michael's comment, you essentially called me a deviant, which is OK. Uh, like At least we didn't call you a diva, uh, so that's uh, that too. <laughs> uh, I've been called a lot worse. So my, I, I my question, it, positive, so. <laughs> it was a positive. So thank you. Uh, picking up on Dan's uh, regulation lightning round, I was struck that all of you uh, focused on regulation of legal education, and I'm thinking about regulation of the legal profession. And Paul, you mentioned ABS in the UK and the extent to which regulation or regulatory innovations in the United States could actually trickle down to law schools and how what kinds of regulatory innovations in the profession might bring about changes in law schools? I just want to say a brief word about marketing and then, and then we'll take it wherever you want. I think it's a great question. Just very briefly, I think the marketing component is actually quite important and it's, and, and it's really developing, sort of uh, fostering the kind of collaboration that Marty talked about. Simply knowing and learning about much more about what law schools are doing. Here's a plug for the AALS's new improved website. But, but in addition to that, what the schools do themselves, maybe for frankly competitive impulses, is a key part of the marketing where we can swipe from playbooks of these other schools some really great ideas. The other thing, which is a little tangential to marketing, the use and utilization of social media, engagement with the media, being out there as deans and law faculty members talking about the schools, that, that the innovations that we're doing, not only quite frankly crowds out a lot of the another story about enrollment decline and the other, but it, but it actually generates and gins up some real enthusiasm and attention, particularly in the face of folks that say in the media, you know, what have law schools done for us lately? Yeah. And I'd just add to that, uh, one, I, I completely agree, but one of the things that we're actually not inherently good at as law professors is the marketing side of, of what we do. And to the extent that we can get in the mindset of we're going to do really great things and then make sure people know about it, both as, as for marketing itself and, and also for the, the sharing and, and open source aspect that, that Dan mentions. Uh, in terms of, uh, Andy, your, your, your question about uh, uh, sort of the, the regulation and, uh, of lawyers, um, that's probably, in a, in a way, that, that's its own panel. The only thing I'd, I'd point out is that, that there is a huge, huge market out there for all of us um, in terms of, uh, and, and Dan mentioned this earlier and, and, and Paul mentioned this earlier, the, what we do here still is, is considered very much the gold standard of legal education. Um, there's lots and lots of people who want it around the world for all sorts of reasons, but for most of them, the end game has something to do with being involved in U.S. legal practice. If we can't find good ways outside of saying, gee, maybe if you go through the right hoops, you can take the New York bar or something like that, uh, of, of helping those folks get into or, or more involved in, in US legal practice, which, which really does mean addressing the, the regulatory aspects around that, um, we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Any real quick last words? No? Um, two quick things on, on marketing. One is that, um, it is so important, so critical. And, and most of your schools are probably understaffed in marketing. Uh, and certainly if you look at other schools in the university, for instance, our business school has 12 marketing people and we have two. Um, and so building that muscle up is gonna be really important the more different kind of audiences we're trying to reach. And one quick suggestion is that on your campus, if you have a continuing education office, or you know, I think ours is called professional education, they're more experienced at this, and so you can maybe get some assistance and, and help there. But it couldn't, I don't think it could be more important to attend to the marketing, because it's not a matter of just building it and people are going to know about it and come. You need to push out for some of the newer programs. Okay. Anybody want to have the last word? Go for it. No, not, not the last word. I'm a little bit of, con of a contrarian when it comes to marketing. Uh, I don't discount its importance, but I want to go back to something I said at the very outset, which is that marketing isn't effective in my opinion unless it advances a vision of what you're trying to do right unless there's a clear vision. whether this is at true at the individual course and classroom and individual faculty level it's true at the disciplinary level it's true at the program level it's true at the school and the community and and, and the institutional level uh, 
you need to have, you need to build, you need to shape a vision of the kind of impact that you're having on your students, the kind of impact that you're having on your community, the kind of impact that you're having on the world around you. If you have that, then the marketing is, never takes care of itself, but it becomes much easier. It also makes the fundraising easier. It makes institutional partnerships easier. It makes community engagement easier. The vision is critical. Uh, I just wanted to sort of reemphasize that. Paul, well, any last? Okay, so let me, uh, before I, I ask you to thank our panel and we all scatter for lunch, let me put a, uh, make a brief commercial announcement. There'll, there's another, uh, uh, to be sure, more narrowly configured program tomorrow morning that I, that I urge you to attend if you're interested and can. At 8.30, uh, uh, President's Program Challenges and Opportunities for U.S. and Chinese Legal Education. It's a remarkable gathering, actually, of some deans and, and, and uh, leading educators from China who are, who are coming here for the very first time. And so, so I hope uh, if you can join us 8.30 to 10.15 tomorrow, Wilson A. at the mezzanine uh, level. But let me take the opportunity to ask you to thank our panel. It's been a great, uh, have a good rest of the meeting. <laughs>